Whenever I'm putting drums in my tracks, I'll finish the basic idea and think to myself, that's a nice little groove. And then I'll instantly become haunted by the drumming spirit of Tony Williams and the knowledge of what drums could be. That was a young Tony Williams going into absolute beast mode with the Miles Davis Quintet. Drummers like Tony Williams, Brian Blade, and countless others left a huge imprint on me in terms of how far the drums could go in contributing to and defining the sound of a group or music. These drummers were playing a rhythmic melody, striving to dialogue, interact, and communicate with the other members of the group or the music in as many dimensions as possible. In this sense, they are a rhythmic four-voice polyphonic instrument one voice for each of the upper extremities and one for each of the lower extremities. Four limbs, four voices. So why am I haunted by this? Because every time I make a track, I listen back to the drums and inevitably I start asking myself, WWTD, what would Tony do? Oftentimes my drum patterns will be satisfying the needs of the tempo and the groove and the style just fine. But then I'll start to think, what if my kick drum was synced up with the specific rhythms of my bass part? And what if my snare drum, instead of just playing on beats two and four, played ghost notes, fills, and rolls that accentuated the melody? What if my hi-hats and cymbals, instead of just playing straight eighth notes or sixteenth notes, changed subdivisions constantly, creating a kind of speech pattern in between all of the rhythmic accents that delicately drove the music forward? I just finished a tune called Still, and it's a good example of me getting lost in this quandary. Let me show you. In this first section, the kick drum is playing the same rhythm as the bass line for the most part. It's doing it as much as possible without sounding awkward. The snare is just playing on beat four, which solidifies this as a drum beat without beating the listener over the head with the backbeat element. Now what about these quick snare fill notes? These are coming from the melody. The melody's playing these exact rhythms for the most part. Now for the hi-hats. The hi-hats are where a lot of the nuance comes from. The hi-hats are being played in three different ways. The accented note, this is the loudest note. Then there are two layers that are triggering the same kind of sample here at a moderate volume. These are just kind of the in-between filler hi-hats, carrying the rhythm forward. And lastly, there is the hi-hat pedal note. So this is the hi-hat pedal being played without striking it with the hands. This creates a kind of quiet click type of sound, but it's very subtle, depending on how hard the pedal is hit. This contributes to the realistic drummer kind of sound because typically it isn't feasible for the drummer to play continuous notes with their hands on the hi-hat, for example. So breaking up this stream of notes by playing with the foot, the left foot, the hi-hat pedal, gives the hands a break to reset and get more steam or more momentum for the next burst of notes. That being said, there are plenty of virtuosic drummers out there who can play all day long super quick with one hand without taking a break. The drum pattern is truly built out of the existing elements in the track, the bass, the melody, and the harmonic parts. This, in my mind, is what a drummer like Tony Williams or Brian Blade are striving to do versus what you'd hear in a typical beat where it's just laying down the downbeat, playing the backbeats, and adding some rhythmic interest for the other elements to kind of just glide and dance on on top without really being deeply connected to what's going on in the music. There's a short little break that gives the arrangement some structure. When the drums come back in, the hi-hat hand, which was played by the right hand stick, has now moved over to the cymbal. 
Now that no stick is striking the hi-hat, it frees the hi-hat up to be played entirely by the foot. In this case, it's being splashed by hitting the pedal but not clamping the hi-hats down, letting them splash together almost like orchestral cymbals. This splashing action happens on every quarter note, which becomes the main timekeeper of the groove. This frees the cymbal up to interact completely and as freely as it wants to with the rhythmic elements going on in the tune. This interaction between the cymbal and the rhythmic elements is to me the essence of the Tony Williams style. This is what I'm always feeling is missing when I go to make a track and I'm just doing a typical kind of hip hop or house beat. I wanna hear that deep connection between the rhythmic element of the cymbal and the rhythmic elements of everything else. I wanna hear them in sync and I usually don't get that. If you haven't noticed by now, this video is partly kind of a journal entry with the soul searching I'm doing in terms of drums at the moment. On the one hand, I like making tracks where the drums are just providing the groove and allows everything to be way more digestible by the listener and also just a lot more enjoyable to make because you're not doing this intense data entry element involved in making drums like you're hearing so far. But on the other hand, I really enjoy this kind of interaction between all the parts in this Tony Williams style. Part of the issue here is that when a live group is playing, you have a live drummer who's spontaneously interacting and communicating and interplaying with the other musicians or other musician. But when we're doing it on a computer like this, there's no spontaneity at all. We're completely contriving it by editing and modifying these patterns until it kind of approximately sounds like people interacting. So maybe the solution is to just play with a drummer or play with other people. Does this add value to the listening experience, this kind of detail, or does it just get processed as, okay, cool, jazz, jazz fusion, over the top, it's too complicated, I'd rather just hear something that's a little bit more grooving without all this kind of intricate detail. What do you think? There is another short break, which is necessary because there's no risers or transition effects signaling new sections to the listener in any kind of obvious way. Really, the only thing indicating different sections here are the little short drum breaks and the changes in rhythm and in timbre. When the drums re-enter just a couple beats later, now the cymbal is even busier. So this is now turning up the energy level of the whole tune. And now the splashing quarter note hi-hats is still on quarter notes, but now it's being a choked, closed hi-hat pedal sound. So there's no more splashing, it's just a short choke sound. In this section, there's a significant change in how the kick is being played. So far, the kick has been linked to the bass activity, the bass line, for the entire song so far. But now in this section, the kick gets linked to the rhythm happening in the melody. This gets pretty syncopated and creates some instability to the groove. This lack of stability is intentional because in the following section, we will finally get a full backbeat groove. The pulse throughout all of this song has been at 186 beats per minute, but now this backbeat groove will be articulated at halftime, feeling at 93 beats per minute. And we'll get that snare finally not just on four, but on two and four. In a rhythmic sense, this is the payoff of the whole journey of the song. This, in my mind, is now the most relaxed part of the song and the most satisfying in a groove way. This is what all that Tony Williams intricacy was building up to.
there's two things I should mention that really make this whole approach to programming drums work. Number one is velocity. By triggering the accented notes at higher velocities and then everything else in between those accented notes and leading up to those accent notes at much lower velocities, you create the feel of how a drummer naturally plays. This is largely in part to the fact that in order for drummers to play notes back to back quickly, they have to bounce the stick which means that the initial hit, the accented note, will probably be the loudest, and then the subsequent notes, the bounces of the stick, will be progressively quieter. Also, you'll probably want to use what's called a multi-sample drum library, which is a drum library where there are multiple samples at multiple velocity levels, so that if you were to trigger a string of straight 16th notes on, let's say, a hi-hat, each time that you were triggering that note, you would get a different sample of a series of samples that are all that same note, that same drum, at that same velocity. This prevents you from getting that mechanical machine type of sound, and really is the essential ingredient to being able to create drum sounds like this in software. All right, well that's it. I hope you got something out of this video. If you want to check out this song, it's coming out this Friday on all the streaming platforms. The pre-save link is in the description. If you want to support the channel, you can do so by signing up for my Patreon, where you'll also get access to all the project files, samples, and a bunch of other materials from the videos you see on this channel. And if you're interested in taking lessons, I offer one-on-one -on -one sessions over Zoom. You can email me at jaronlessons at gmail.com for more info and scheduling. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.